Hi, my name is Madeline Winans, and I am currently the program coordinator for the Center for Human-Animal Interactions Research and Education at The Ohio State University. Today, I'm going to be presenting a portion of my master's research, which concluded with my graduation this past May. So before we dive into this study, it's important to take a moment to consider why this work was necessary. So California sea lions are relatively frequent in zoos, and in North America, the species accounts for nearly a third of all marine mammals in zoos. And within zoos and aquariums, animals are relocated frequently, given that now zoos primarily acquire animals from other institutions rather than from the wild. Additionally, we know these relocation processes have potential stressors involved, so we have an obligation to be monitoring the welfare of these animals throughout these processes. So when Columbus Zoo and Aquarium began planning for their new region that would be home to California sea lions, we partnered with them to conduct a long-term welfare assessment of the sea lions throughout this relocation process from a temporary facility in Florida to their new habitat at Columbus Zoo and Aquarium here in Ohio. So last year, I actually had the opportunity to present data from the pre-relocation phase of our project. And I'm excited this year to get to share the full project with you now. So the objective of our project was to measure the effect of facility relocation on the sea lion's welfare through measurement of animal behavior. Now we also measured hair cortisol concentrations, but that is a talk for another day. We hypothesized that we would see more active behavior such as swimming post relocation. Our study population consisted of seven California sea lions, five males and two females. All males in the population were reproductively intact. A natural breeding did occur. And so one animal was actually born during the pre-relocation phase, that was M5. And that individual was then included in the study population. So the study was separated into three phases. We had pre-relocation, which began in March of 2018 through May of 2020. Relocation or transporting the animals, which took place in May of 2020. And then the post-relocation phase, which ran from May of 2020 to January of 2021. Now today I'm just gonna focus on comparing the animal behavior data from the pre and post relocation phases, which were actually divided into 10 periods of data collection, five periods each. Now in these two phases, there were some noteworthy differences between the animal's environments, pre and post relocation. Firstly, we have geographic location. So prior to relocation, the animals were housed in Florida, and then following relocation, their new environment was here in Ohio. And post relocation, there were also relatively high levels of visitor traffic, whereas the temporary facility in Florida was not open to the public. And finally, post relocation, animals had access to much more space. There were just or around 330,000 gallons of water across all of the pools available in the post relocation environment, whereas there was just under 80,000 gallons available pre relocation. So to conduct behavior observations, we employed a scan sampling methodology in which we recorded scans in 10 minute intervals over two hour sessions. Observations were conducted by a live observer and time of day was randomized between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Here is the ethogram we used for the study. It was compiled from previous literature on pinniped behavior. And there are two behaviors I wanted to point out. We have random swimming and resting hauled out or hauled out of water. And these are the two behaviors I'll be focusing on primarily in the results. So to start off our results here, we have the mean percent of time spent on a given behavior by the population over the duration of the study. So essentially we have an activity budget here. Now, the first thing to draw your attention to are these two behaviors. We have pattern swimming and self-directed behaviors. Now pattern swimming and excessive amounts of self-directed behaviors are considered to be potential stereotypies for this species, where a stereotypy is a repetitive, unvarying, and apparently functionless behavioral pattern. And these are typically evaluated as potential indicators of a welfare concern. However, here we see that pattern swimming and self-directed behaviors occurred in relatively low frequencies. And also occurrence of these behaviors is not inherently indicative of negative welfare. And so it was determined that stereotypic behavior was not a major welfare concern at this point in time. However, it has been continued to be carefully assessed. 
Now, all of these behaviors highlighted here consisted of less than 5% of the population's activity budget, and so they were excluded from any further analysis. And then here we have um, maternal behaviors, which was the third most frequent behavior category. However, given that these behaviors applied only to two individuals in the population and only for a small portion of the study, these behaviors were also excluded from further analysis. And so that leaves us with random swimming and resting hauled out as the two most common behaviors, or excuse me, accounting cumulatively for between 80 to 90% of the population's overall activity budget. And so therefore we'll be focusing on these two behaviors for the additional analyses presented. So here we are breaking down the percent of time spent random swimming across all 10 periods of data collection. And on our X axis at the bottom here, we see the periods separated into pre-relocation in blue and post-relocation in gray. And we have percent of time spent swimming on the Y axis. And you can see, although there was some variation here, the sea lions did in fact spend more time swimming post-relocation, as you can see in this table in the top left corner, or excuse me, top right corner. Now here we have a similar graph showing the percent of time spent resting out of water across the study periods. One thing to note here is that in period six, which was the first time the sea lions had access to their new environment, they actually spent no time resting. They were active the entire observation session. And in fact, overall, the sea lions did spend less time resting pre, or excuse me, post relocation. So considering our findings, were these behavior patterns that we observed consistent with what we would expect to see? Well, we observed random swimming and resting out of the water most frequently, which is consistent with findings both in human care and of populations in their native ranges. Now we did see relatively low frequencies of behaviors such as grooming, vocalization, and conspecific interactions, but these are short-term behavioral events that you're less likely to capture with scan sampling. However, given that we were more interested in longer term behavioral states, this was a limitation that we were willing to accept here. And so overall, we did in fact find that the sea lions spent more time on active behavior like swimming post relocation. But why is this and what does it tell us about their welfare? Well, that's actually quite a complicated question to answer. So some of the factors that might be contributing to this change we saw include the effects of seasonality and the breeding season and a difficulty in determining whether a change in behavior is indicative of positive or negative state of stress and of course variation in individual personalities. And so where does this leave us? With everyone's favorite answer, a need for more research. So given that this was the first study to assess the impact of relocation on marine mammal welfare in a zoo setting, although these findings are somewhat preliminary, they provide a foundation for the very necessary future research in this field to improve the welfare of marine mammals in human care. So with that, on behalf of our entire research team, thank you very much for watching this presentation.